Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone shuts down Tent City. Also tonight, we'll hear about efforts to increase access to justice in Arizona, and we'll learn about a new way to increase plant yields, even in times of drought. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone announced this afternoon that he is closing Tent City. The sheriff said that he made the decision to shut down the controversial facility based on the recommendation of an advisory committee. I am shutting down Tent City. This facility is not a crime deterrent. It is not cost efficient and it is not tough on criminals. That may have been the intent when it was first opened and there was a need, but this facility became more of a circus atmosphere for the general public. Starting today, that circus ends and these tents come down. For those who are concerned, let me be as crystal clear as I can be. I have five other detention centers with plenty of space. No inmates are going free, and if you commit a crime in Maricopa County, you will be incarcerated and detained in our facilities. We have the room. Penzone adds that it will take months to actually close down the tents. Here now with more on the decision to close one of the hallmarks of former Sheriff Joe Arpaio's years in office is former State Attorney General Grant Woods, who chaired the committee that recommended closing Tent City. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Uh, the committee says yeah. close it down. I think it was unanimous, was it yes, not? It was. Mm -hmm. Why? It really didn't make sense anymore on, on any front. Um, I think um, people should understand the, the reason it came about in the first place probably was a decent reason, and that is we had a big uh, surge in inmate population in 1993. Who was attorney general then? <laughs> Tough on crime, this yes. guy. Yes. Yeah, so we had to lock these guys up. Somewhere. Sure you did. <laughs> and uh, now there, so, you know, we needed beds in, in those days, and they came up with the idea, well, what about tents? And tents have been used sparingly around the country on a temporary basis only. Okay, so you could kind of see that. Well, uh, those days came and went, and it became something else. Really, I think, uh, uh, as the sheriff said, it became more about... Um, the previous occupant of the office than anything else. So when you look at it, um, the, the costs remain the same at Tent City, regardless of how many inmates are there, because it, it just, you got so much you got to supervise and guard and all of that. So um, it's, its peak, it probably had 1,700 prisoners, and now it has seven or 800, so about half. And yet the costs are the same. There's zero evidence that it's, uh, tough on these criminals that they don't want to go back. We're going to be so hard on them. They won't want to come back. It doesn't affect recidivism. It doesn't affect deterrence. Zero. In fact, I think the most surprising thing that we found was that um, if you go talk to the prisoners out there, I'm going to tell you it's probably 100 percent. They were telling us, please don't close it down. We like it here. We want to be here because they'd rather be outdoors, even if it's hot or if it's cold or whatever, than cooped up in a little jail cell. And I could kind of understand that. And that's fine, except A, they don't get to vote, and B, it's totally against how it was portrayed for the last, you know, 23 years. And yet <clears throat> anecdotal evidence, we hear all the time people saying, or, or, or they know someone who mm -hmm. did a DUI stint in there mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Oh, you never want to go back there. Once you, this was the worst place. It, it's a real deterrent. You say no deterrence? Zero. Yeah. I mean, I think those people would say the exact same thing if they were if they were held in a small cell with a roommate, 23 hours out of the 24-hour day. These prisoners out there. You also got to remember, in talking to them, they get to um, like let's say in the summer, uh, they, they have day rooms out there. And they go in the day room, they, it's air conditioned. They can hang out in there, and they do hang out in there. They take showers and cool off, and then they go outside for a while, then they go back in. So this, this whole thing was uh, really, you know, uh, kind of hyped, overhyped. As far as other factors, uh, the cost was obviously looked at. Officer safety, was that looked at? Um, I think officer, uh, the utilization of officers for one thing, because uh, 
with Tent City, we've seen just, an, they have an enormous amount of overtime they have to do out there. So now one of the savings will be those officers will be able to go back into the other five facilities now. So they're estimating about four and a half million dollars that will be saved annually to the taxpayers, uh, or they can use that money in other areas. And as far as safety, I think it's a little bit of safety, but it's also, um, you know, those guys have the full outfits on during the summer. They didn't do anything wrong, you know? So the prisoner can say, yeah, I don't mind it that much, you know, it's okay. Uh, that's not fair to the officers either, necessarily. So I think it's, I think it's a benefit there. As far as the board is concerned, unanimous uh, to close it, were any, any uh, options, any ideas brought up and, hey, maybe we should maybe slow it down, yeah. phase it out, something along those lines yeah, we as talked opposed about to shuttering that. it. I'll tell you why we talked about it is because, um, well, first, there were was, there was some people on the board, several people, uh, who in the past have been supportive of the concept of Tent City, being tough on criminals. I, I think I was plenty tough on criminals when I was attorney general. Um, after we all toured and uh, some went out individually, I went out individually and heard from the inmates and they were begging us not to close it, people started to reassess a little bit and it was, kind of, it was a weird dynamic, Ted, because if it, was, if it would have been, hey, this is, this is inhumane, it's cruel and unusual, then we would have said, well, you gotta close it. Well, now it's like, it's not, that's how it was portrayed, but it really wasn't like that. So now what do we do? So we looked at, at all of the, the, the finances, uh, the, uh, whether it serves any public safety purpose, which it doesn't, and also the image of Arizona that that helped promote. And we heard from, we had experts come in from around the country, and they told us in no uncertain terms, Arizona has an image, because of Tent City only, in, this, in the corrections community, as a real pariah, that this is a joke. Nobody does it. You know how many people, uh, how many jurisdictions have to deal with jails? every place that where there's people in the United States. You know how many people have tents? Zero, except for us. So that tells you something. So I, this image that we are inhumane, that we will do anything uh, to punish people, that's not a great image. You can be tough on crime and still retain your humanity. You don't have to sink down to the criminal's level. The idea of, uh, we'll hear from some Arpaio supporters, I'm sure, saying mm -hmm. the only reason this place is being shut down is to get back at Joe Arpaio, mm -hmm. to erase whatever they can regarding, you know, Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, any retribution, anything along those lines, anything mm -hmm. like whatever he likes, we don't? Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think this Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Pinzone has been remarkable to me in watching him be pretty much politics free. He's, um, he's doing what he thinks needs to be done and the chips will fall where they may. He could be doing a lot of things political, and you haven't seen him really do anything political, he's just doing his job here. And it shouldn't come as a big surprise to anyone who's really looked at something like Tent City to see that he would say, I'm not gonna waste money on that anymore. Maybe it'll make me look good, but I'm not going to. If there are things that Arpaio did uh, that work and that will increase our public safety, great, he'll try to, uh, Keep them going and improve upon them. But everything else is, is going to go, and it has nothing to do with politics. This has to, has to do with a new, fresh face coming in in 2017 and saying, let's do better. The criminal justice community, you kind of referred to this <clears throat> earlier, around the country. Yeah. Um, how did they see Joe Arpaio? Not well. 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, I mean... Uh, 90, 10. Really, that 95, much? 95, 5. Yes, because these are professionals, and they take themselves seriously. If you talk to police officers, uh, ask them what they thought off the record. Um, you see, th this is their job, okay? It's kind of like, um, you know, you've been doing this for a while now, and you take your job seriously, and you do a great job at it, and it's a great public service, and then you have someone who it's all about them, they're not interested in substance, they're not interested in getting the job done, they're just interested in kind of being a megalomaniac, you don't really appreciate that because it brings everybody down. So in the corrections world, no, he was looked upon very poorly. Um, he had his following here, it was a strong following, but he let it slip away because it became too much about him and not enough about the taxpayer and about public safety. And that's what this sheriff cares about, the taxpayer and about public safety, and the rest will chips will fall where they may. I noticed the announcement came on the uh, assassination date of Martin Luther King 
Any, uh, any coincidence there? Any? I think it is a coincidence, but it's a, it's a good message because that um, something I've, I've felt strongly about and tried to promote my entire public life and private life here, and that is Arizona can be a le leader in civil rights, and we should be a leader in civil rights, and sometimes we have been a leader in civil rights. We are not some backwater place. We are not a racist or bigoted place. We're not a place that doesn't care about uh, uh, basic human rights. We're better than that. We've always been better than that. We just have to show the world that we're better than that. All right. Grant Woods, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. And coming up, we'll hear about how bacteria can help plant growth in drought conditions. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are, anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before. Access to justice is a main goal for a number of Arizona leaders, including the governor and the chief justice of the state Supreme Court. But what efforts are underway to achieve that goal? For the answers, we turn to Arizona Court of Appeals Judge Larry Winthrop, who chairs the Arizona Commission on Access to Justice. Good to have you here. Welcome to Arizona. Thank you very Horizon. much. Um, the Arizona Commission on Access to Justice. Give me a better definition. What are we talking about? So this is a, this is a group of people that have been gathered together uh, by the Chief Justice to further the court's five-year strategic agenda. Um, and these are folks from across the state, urban centers, rural areas, private sector, public sector, judges, lawyers, um, educators, um, community foundation leaders, business community. And um, we also reach out to others with expertise in various work groups. And over the last two and a half years, we've been working to create partnerships with various segments of our state and the communities in our state, the business community, the law schools, the courts, the legislature, and as you mentioned, the governor's office. And the idea, again, there's the five-year strategic agenda, the goal to improve effective access to justice. What does that mean? Well, I think what we saw um, coming out of the recession, or during the recession and coming out of it, was this tremendous boost in the percentage of people who are trying to represent themselves in court. Now, whether that's the result of uh, Arizona's large poverty population, or whether it's the result of our middle class not being comfortable with the idea of paying lawyers, or whether it's folks knowing that there's information on the internet or, or watching these legal dramas and realize and think they can solve uh, any legal dispute in 40 minutes plus commercials, we just saw this tremendous rise uh, in self-represented litigants, particularly in our family courts, where in over 80% of the family court cases, and those are divorces, uh, child custody issues, support, alimony, et cetera, in over 80% of those cases, one or both of the people are representing themselves. And that's a statistic that's not just common to Arizona, it was duplicated across the country. And that's why we've seen the development of these commissions uh, nationally. And Arizona was the 34th, and, and there's probably over 40 now. So basically to help folks, eviction cases I think is big there as well, they where are. folks want to represent themselves, give them what, to make the forms easier to understand, for starters, I would think? Well, I think what we found is that uh, our, our judicial system, our justice system, was not designed for everyday folks to go in and represent themselves. It was designed to work best with lawyers. So it's, it's a difficult 
uh, challenge for them. So what we've been trying to do is educate people about what they can do and how they can do it without giving them legal advice, but rather access to meaningful legal information. And I know as well, uh, low-income folks, uh, their access to justice for them, that's a concern as well. Well, absolutely. I mean, and these folks, our poverty population, which is higher here in Arizona than it is nationally, um, the people we're talking about is the work, are the working poor. They are not the folks standing by the side of the freeway holding up a sign. These are our neighbors, our friends, our family members, and they are working for our state's largest employers on a part-time or full-time basis. But they are one unexpected event away from being out of a job, out of their home. They do not have the capacity to deal with an unexpected event. So are we seeing progress for the low-income folks, for the folks who want to represent themselves? Are we seeing things moving forward here? We are. Uh, we're working on a variety of things, uh, some that are very, very exciting. For example, in the family court area we're talking about, uh, the Maricopa County Superior Court um, has launched a project. It's now been in place for a, a little over a year. They've created a court navigator program where they've taken 35 to 40 undergraduate students from ASU. They're trained and supervised by court staff, and they help these self-represented litigants from start to finish, even to the point of showing them which courtroom they need to go to, what is expected of them in the forms they have to fill out, and helping them in that capacity. Um, but that's, that's a great program here in Maricopa County. It's a great, uh, and the county has opened a new uh, legal resource center. But you know, not everybody in Arizona has access to that type of, of facility. So uh, another project has been to go into the public libraries across the state. Now we think of public libraries as just as a great community resource where people go to get information, and they are. They've been a little uh, uh, under, underutilized in the last few years with the digital uh, yes. age. So the libraries were very receptive to our idea of, of, of helping them understand and helping them teach their patrons where they can find legal information. And so we've gone into every county and trained public librarians to help their patrons find this information. So this five-year strategic agenda, it's moving right along. What, uh, year one, year two, what are we at? We are uh, about two and a half years into the process. Another great uh, program that just launched is, is this website, AZ Court Help, which is a, 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 an interactive website for anyone who wants to find out anything you want to know about, about being in court. There are, uh, there's information about uh, courthouses, where to find them, directions, information about little things like where do I park, can I bring a child, can I bring a bottle of water, to how do I pay. Um, and on that website, there's, there's a series of uh, tutorials about what you can expect in certain types of cases. There's links to forms that people can use. Uh, so it, it, it's a great it's a great resource. Real quickly, give me that website one more time with that. AZ website. Court Help. AZ Court Help. Yes. All right. Well, it sounds like things are moving forward and access to justice is a little bit easier now than it used to be. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us. Could I, could I make one last? One last. All right. So this is last minute tax planning for folks. There's a tax credit here in Arizona for uh, charitable dona donations to qualifying charitable organizations. There's a number of them that provide legal services to the poor. And so you have until April 17th. <laughs> Individual filers can All right, $400 you, you uh, joint filers. Son of a gun there. You got that in. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it.
Researchers at Northern Arizona University have found a way to increase vegetable and grain yields by using bacteria. The results show even greater yield for plants shown in drought conditions. Here to explain all this is NAU doctoral student Rachel Rubin of the Center for Ecosystem Science and Society. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you for having me. This is fascinating, mostly because I have no idea what this is all about here. In general, um, soil-borne soil bacteria helping, am I I'm on the... Plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, it's kind of a mouthful. Yes. Um, but they're basically a bacteria that live in and around plant roots so they can live inside the roots or on the root surface or in the soil surrounding the plant root. And they're a special type of symbiosis called a mutualism. So that means that it's a mutually beneficial relationship between the plants and the bacteria. And this, I mean, they're cooperating. I mean, they don't have to cooperate, do they? <laughs> they, ha they don't have to and they don't always. Yes. Um, but in this case, we're looking at this is a scenario where the plant has something that the bacteria needs and vice versa. So these bacteria are living in and around the roots and they're feeding off of sugars and carbohydrates that are exuded from the plant roots. And in exchange for energy and a place to live, they can help the plant forage for nutrients more effectively. They can also produce biofilms that help retain water during drought, for example. So is that, explain that, because I mean, the fascinating thing is this works. But the idea that it works really well in drought conditions, that's big stuff. Yeah, How does that work? How does that work? That's really encouraging. We've known about um, various functions that these bacteria can do for plants, such as providing nutrients and forms of uh, disease control. But um, the ability to help plants cope with extreme events, such as drought, is a relatively new horizon. So that's what we wanted to capitalize on this for this meta-analysis, and we looked at 52 studies conducted all around the world. And it's not, there's not one way that the bacteria help plants cope with drought. It's very varied. And so um, this is a cool way that we were able to aggregate all of those studies and get a general idea of how effective we can expect them to be. Now this it promotes growth, protects against pathogens, these sorts of things. I mean, it really, it really is a cooperative relationship, isn't it? Definitely. Um, it's one of those beautiful things about nature. Yeah. It's not always beautiful, but <laughs> I like um, when it works out. And I guess soil in general, correct me if I'm wrong here now, you got irrigation, you've got uh, artificial selection, you've got fertilizers, all that stuff out there. That degrades the soil to a certain extent, and thus plants need all the help they can get. Certainly. All of those practices, while they've increased yields, um, we worry that they might have a negative impact on symbioses. Um, so extensive pesticide and fertilizer use and monocultures, um, they could degrade the soil so that it's no longer productive. So this, this idea of using microbes to reinvigorate soil that's degraded is what we're going for. We're looking at areas that um, are no longer productive and maybe we can reinstate those microbes where they're needed the most. Now, are these, is this with all plants? Do certain plants work better than, uh, do some plants that they just don't cooperate? It's just not gonna work. <laughs> yeah, every, every site's different, every study's different, but it was cool that we did find this is a pretty generalizable effect across all plants. Um, there was, they do seem to be a little bit more effective for warm season grasses such as corn and sorghum. Interesting. And they're a little less effective on rice and wheat plants. But that's the less effective as far as you know now, right? I mean, there could be back there, there could be stuff out there that we're not even aware of. Yeah, new ones are still being discovered. It's this is a new field. It's about 15 years in the making. It, it, it strikes me that this is somewhat similar to bacteria in the gut and what we're learning about that and you know probiotics and all that business that I don't understand either, but it sounds similar. Yeah. It is similar in concept. I mean, just like humans, plants co-evolved with their microbiome. Um, and so it's very important for their survival. And I think this study really illustrates how important they are because when we add those bacteria in, the plants really flourish. I think there's a visual showing that. that oh, is cool. there really? I, yeah. I, I'm not aware of that, but if okay. there is, we'll, we'll take a look, and if not, we'll just imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that was a visual. Um, how was the hypothesis developed? I mean, who, who, who decided, hey, I wonder if this will work? Yeah, this was, I kind of, I saw a void in the literature on this topic. Um, there's a lot that we know about soil fungi, 
but we know a lot less about bacteria. And I just noticed that there was a lot of studies being conducted on this topic, and I wanted to get a sense of how, what's the general consensus? What can we expect to find? Because every study is so different, and not everyone's going to be able to read all these scientific sure. papers. Sure. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so we got about 30, 45 seconds left here. Okay. What does all of this mean? I mean, this is obvious. This is a big deal for you. This is, this is groundbreaking stuff you're doing here. Um, but what does it all mean? Well, it means that um, this is encouraging that in the areas of the world that need this the most, that bacteria could really help them survive. Between 20 and 40 percent uh, increase in growth is what we found. And the effect was greater under drought. So this gives me hope about the future of agriculture. And I hope that we can have more efforts to improve soil biodiversity using well, this method. Yeah, it gives a lot of people hope. This is really good stuff. Congratulations and continued success. Thank and thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.